Well, it has certainly been a very busy month for this new space race that we are seeing play out with the flight of uh, Virgin Galactic's manned flight in the early levels of outer space, and now the launch of Blue Origin's new Shepard rocket. Retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Terry Virts is a NASA astronaut and is part of the Endeavor launch back in 2010. He's conducted three spacewalks, logged over 200 days in space, and a pleasure to have him joining us here today. Terry, great to talk to you. I hope you're doing well. Good to be there, Dan. It's been uh, it's been a cool month for space, that's for sure. It has been. So, give me your just your general thoughts on both of these flights, and and obviously they went well. It seems like, but it, it's kind of laying the groundwork for where we think uh, this is headed over the next few years. Yeah, I think it's exciting. You know, I think whenever people are doing new things in space, that's very cool. Uh, both of these companies want to take up a lot of space tourists. And I think that's going to be a good thing. I think the more people that get a chance to experience weightlessness and look back at the planet, even if it's only for three minutes or so, um, I think that's going to be a good thing. Uh, I think it provides jobs. You know, this is an industry that uh, there's been a lot of angst about oh, billionaires are just having fun. But actually, those billionaires are not launching billions of dollars into space. They're spending that money down here on Earth. And there's a lot of Good paying middle class jobs that are uh, that are you know providing for families down here on the planet. So I think that's a good thing. So if, if you can talk about that for a moment, because I don't think a, a lot of people focus on that as you know as a growth industry at the mm -hmm. uh, the potential of future jobs that that we will see play out. What types of jobs are, are you are you expecting that we will see come on board? Well, um, several of my former astronaut colleagues are pilots and mission directors at Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. So they're making, you know, an, a good middle class job with benefits and their families are provided for thanks to these companies. Um, it's kind of like, you know, the business jet industry that there's lots of pilots and engineers and mechanics and stuff that that build business jets. And yes, a lot of them are operated by very wealthy people, but thankfully they are operated because that provides these jobs. And it's going to be the same thing in the space industry. And these are, a lot of them are high tech engineering, uh, manufacturing types of jobs. And that is exactly what America does great at and what we need. So we have obviously a couple of companies that are involved in this right now, but can you see a point where this becomes an opportunity for other companies to be able to jump on board at some point? It, that's interesting that you say that. This morning, I had a meeting uh, with a venture capital fund um, is asking me to be an advisor for a, a moon company. It's a company focused on the, the lunar economy. And there's a lot of activity happening around the moon, a lot of government money being spent there. And uh, they're trying to open it up for some serious economic activity, basically collecting data about the moon. And uh, so, yes, there's a lot of companies that are being spun out of that. Like I said, I just talked to one this morning um, and it's an exciting time. You know, it's not uh, this multi-trillion dollar industry. Amazon delivering stuff to your front door is a much bigger business than the space business is, but it's real money. I mean, the, the space industry in general is several hundred billion dollars a year. So what do you think then is the realistic future for this type of industry, and if if there are companies that are thinking about a lunar economy, yeah, then they have a realistic goal that at some point we may have the potential of having inhabited, uh, uh, you know, people living on the moon, yeah. and, and developing a culture there. For sure, and so that that's Jeff Bezos' goal, and he's the richest man on earth. I mean, he has you know he has some spare change in the couch that he can fund these things for, which is which is a good thing. I mean, this is something that can benefit humanity. Um, I think the in the short term, the the moon and Mars is going to be a government driven economy, you know, it's government dollars that are going to be funding the companies that do this research and exploration. In the long term, there could be minerals that you could mine. And that would be probably one of the most obvious, you know, low hanging, it's not a low hanging fruit, it's a very high hanging fruit, but that would be, <laughs> that would be what we you know where companies could, could benefit from would be from mining. And then of course, in Earth orbit, there's telecommunications, there's observation, um, there, there's some real practical things. I mean, the reason we're having this conversation right now is because we have satellites that can do communication. So, um, but that's more of an Earth orbit, you know, traditional space economy. So how much then will NASA be involved in that entire process in the years ahead? Well, for the, for the lunar economy, NASA 
will be very involved. Um, there's also some uh, military money being spent to, you know, make sure that we can get to and from the moon safely. But that, I don't think that's going to be as big as Na NASA's budget for going to the moon will probably be the main driver. And it's, you know, it's to the tune of several billion dollars a year they're spending on hopeful eventual uh, lunar exploration. I, I think the, the interesting thing about the Blue Origin flight was not only the fact that Jeff Bezos was on it, but also the other passengers that were on it. 82-year-old Wally Funk, who I understand was really at the outset uh, of the space race yeah. you know, back in the 60s and didn't get the chance to be a part uh, right. of a uh, of flight then. And then obviously also the 18-year-old Oliver Damon. So we're seeing both ends of uh, uh, of the potential passenger spectrum here. And the Bezos brothers, I, I think they were the first ever brothers to fly on a spaceship together. So it was like all four passengers were a first, um, you know, the oldest, the youngest, and the first ever brothers. Um, and, the, and there's going to be lots of these stories to come in the future. And uh, I, I think it's a good thing. And, you know, the cost, Virgin Galactic is advertised at 250000 Bezos hasn't set his price yet, but it'll probably be, you know, roughly in the same thing. So I don't have an extra 250000 laying around, but, you know, being a radio man, I'm sure you do, but... Uh, you <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you, though. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, you know, but if you live in America or Western Europe or Japan and you have a good middle class job, you, you could save up a couple hundred thousand dollars. That is in the realm of possibility. And so this opens up the chance to get to space, even if it is only for a few minutes, for millions of people, you know, not for billions of people, but for millions of people. So um, I think it's a I think it's a good positive development. That was going to be my next question anyway, is just from the pricing component. Yeah. Right now, it's not realistic for a lot of the public. Right. But I guess the question is, can we get it to a point where it becomes a little bit more realistic? And, and what would that time frame look like at this point? You know, they, they might be able to get it down to five figures. Um, they're not going to, it's never going to be the cost of an airline. It's just, you have to go a lot faster than an airline and energy costs money, I, I think anyway. Um, but so it's always going to be an expensive trip and it's, you know, and, and if you want, if you want to get into orbit, it's, you know, add two zeros onto the cost of that trip, but, you know, getting into orbit is a, is a much different uh, thing. And the other thing to think about too, is the, is the risk. Um, you know, these things are not super dangerous. They've, I think uh, the blue origin rocket new shepherd has launched, I think 15, 16 times. And so they, you know, they have some experience under their belt, but, of you know there will be accidents as as we as you fly into space and that's something that people just need to be aware of but realistically i think the two are slightly different in terms of mindset you mentioned about with jeff bezos the mindset probably is to try and go to the moon at some point yeah i i get the sense with virgin galactic the the focus may be more on on a different type of travel here around the planet, thinking yeah. about going from New York to China, going over the polar ice cap and doing it in a much shorter time right. than it would be with the other types of flights you would take. They're very different companies. Virgin Galactic is a space tourism company. They built this vehicle specifically to go up a few minutes in space and come right back down. And it's it's piloted. There's two pilots up front flying the thing, which I really like as a test pilot myself. I really like that. The Bezos capsule is 100% automated. There's no, all that you have to do is unstrap yourself, float around, and then get back in the seat and strap yourself in. Those are the two tasks, and so they're very different philosophies. Also, Virgin has Virgin Orbit, which uses a similar launcher to launch small rockets into orbit. But uh, Bezos has much, much, much bigger designs on getting into orbit and getting to the moon. This small rocket is called the New Shepard. He's got a new Glenn rocket that's going to be a competitor for SpaceX's Falcon 9. And that's going to be, I think, a mainstay of, you know, orbit types of satellite launching. And then he has the new Armstrong that is going to be a really big rocket, kind of a competitor to NASA's SLS and SpaceX's BFR. And uh, it's... It's so Bezos has very big designs. He's just about ten years behind Elon. He's he's really trailing, but in the long run, he he does have some plans. Well, we hadn't talked about SpaceX, so let's touch on it here in the last couple of minutes. We have is that obviously the the SpaceX had kind of been at the forefront of a mm -hmm. lot of this over the last several years. So 
where do you think they are right now? And, and is this going to be somewhat of a, of a, I don't want to say level playing field, but a playing field where all three can benefit in the years ahead? So uh, it's interesting. I have a book that just came out, How to Astronaut, and I actually added a chapter in the end because of this competition going on and, and things to know if you're ever going to be a space tourist. But when it comes to um, what Elon Musk is doing and what Bezos is doing, ironically, are kind of similar. They're both starting with smaller rockets, then they're going to have a midsize launch into orbit, and then they want to make a really big rocket, the kind of thing that you need if you want to go to the moon or Mars. So they're actually doing a similar thing and believe it or not blue origin was the first company to land a rocket vertically um they did it shortly before spacex does it but now spacex does it constantly on these orbital missions um the the big difference is elon is just way ahead you know he started a few years earlier but he has gotten lots and lots and lots of successes under his belt and uh blue origins rocket hasn't even made it into orbit yet they've just done these small suborbital flights so but Bezos has resources. And so in the long run, I think he's going to be a player. But in the short run, it's been all SpaceX so far. Well, and obviously, it, it's great to have the interest back about yeah. space and space travel. And I know you're doing a podcast as well. Tell us a little about, about the podcast and what you talk about on it. Yeah, I, I just started a podcast down to earth with Terry Virts. And it's really, a, I talk about anything. And I, I had a great, actually this week, uh, if you, if your listeners only listen to one podcast, please listen to the one with, with Kuzat and Arvin. Um, they started a business teaching basically uh, people how to code. And he, he came from, he's a Uyghur. He came from China as a refugee, had to, got arrested, had to escape the Chinese government, um, spent two years in Turkey, made it to America, was working in a, uh, minimum wage job at the mall, barely could pay for his baby and wife. And uh, he learned how to code. And now he started this. I, I met him at Harvard Business School. I'm teach, I teach there and, as a guest lecturer, and he was one of the students. And just an incredible story of being a refugee escaping from China. And now he's a Harvard Business School grad, you know, running a startup that has, I think, 2000 students around the world. It's a really cool show and and I learned what it was like to be poor just things that I had never thought of he was telling me you know when a few years ago he was dirt poor and it was a really eye opening podcast that was one thing i've had space guys i had the ceo of guide dogs for the blind i've had baseball folks on i had the two guys that have been talking about ufo's and aliens so i have a very wide <laughs> very wide range of guests well it, it's great that you're doing it and terry it's great to uh, talk to you again and we will stay in touch and do this again because, it, I mean, I think I, I've been somebody, you know, I'm 54, almost 55 years of age. And so I've seen the space race develop from my early years. And, and I think it's just fantastic to watch and see how this all develops in the years ahead. So thanks for giving us a few moments today. Thanks for having me on. It's good to have competition, too, with Richard Branson and Elon and and uh, Jeff Bezos. It's good to see these guys because, you know what, if without the Yankees, the Red Sox would suck. And so they it's good to have competition. Terry, thanks again. All the best to you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Terry Virts, retired U.S. Air Force Colonel and, of course, NASA astronaut.